let's start with number one. Make sure right. you know how to do a basic limit. What's the limit of that function as x goes to minus 2? Um, one sec. So, negative 2 cubed plus me minus negative 2 squared plus, oh yeah, plus 1. Um, Okay, so what is that? Hold on, calculator. Um, you should be able to do this. It, you need to be able to do this without the calculator. If you need a calculator to do this, then we need to go back and review stuff. What's negative 2 cubed? Um, 8. It's negative 8. We got negative 2 times negative 2 times negative 2. That's three negatives in a row, which produce a negative. Okay? Okay. What is negative 2 squared? Um, that's 8. Positive. Or, no, 4, 4, sorry. Positive 4. Now, what's the result of minus 8, minus 8, plus 1? Um, negative 15. Right. So, limit problems where you just substitute and you come up with a number are very straightforward. Okay? Uh, even number 2 is no different than number 1. In other words, what's number two going to be? Tell me how I should write it. Uh, it should be um, factored. So Well, no, we don't need to factor it. In other words, we can just plug in the numbers for x, and we'll have our answer. So how should I write it? Um, negative 2 squared plus 1 over 3 times negative 2 squared minus 2 times negative 2 plus 5. And I think that this is a very important step. You don't want to skip this step ever. In other words, you want to write it exactly like this. And then simplify. Do not try to simplify this all in one step. It's too easy to make a mistake. So what's the numerator? The numerator is 5. Okay. What's the denominator? Um, the denominator would be 4, 13. All right. Let's go through the denominator. What is minus 2 squared? 4. So it's 3 times 4. Which is 12. What's minus 2 times a minus 2? Oh, plus 4. What's that number? 25. It's 21. 3 times 4 is 12, plus 9 is 21. So that's the limit. Okay, so okay. on all of these where, uh, how about number three? What's three? Three would be um, the square root of uh, negative seven. Okay, and what, have they told you anything about that? I mean... Since we now yeah. know complex numbers, that's square root of 7i. But I'm not quite sure how they want you to answer number 3. Do you Do you know? Are we supposed to say yeah. the limit doesn't exist? I think it's the square root of negative 7. 
is the answer. Yeah. Do you have answers for any of these? Um, I do in my binder, not with me. Okay. Be worth knowing because that's either the square root of negative 7 or it's undefined because you can't take the square root of negative numbers. So I'm not sure what they want uh, for that. Same thing with number 4. What's, the num what's number 4 going to be? Number four would be, oh goodness, um, 9 minus 25, which is negative 16, uh, so it's 2. No, you can't take the fourth root of a negative number either. You cannot take the even root of a negative number. However, they may, given that you know complex numbers, they may say this is the uh, 2i. Let's, let's talk about negative numbers. I'm not sure how they're treating the square root of negative numbers. But if I had the fourth root of negative 16, which is what this is, well, that's the same thing as the fourth root of negative 1 times the fourth root of 16. Well, the fourth root of negative 1 is just i. It's the same as the square root of i. And the fourth root of 16 is 2. 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 is 16. So, yeah, I'm not sure that that's 2i, actually, because the fourth root of negative 1 is actually not i. The square root of negative 1 is i. So, I don't know what, they're try what your teacher is trying to accomplish with these kind of questions. Let's go further. Now we have a true limit problem on number five. Why is this a true limit problem? Because it's the limit as it approaches zero. It's zero over zero. Zero over zero is the one indeterminate that you don't know what it's going to be unless you do some algebra or you know other things. In other words, if I plug in 0 for x, I get 1 half minus 1 half, that's 0, divided by 0. So, how do we do this one? And the answer, you would answer take the is not, LCD, right? the answer is not 0 over 0. So you take the LCD and multiply all of them by it. Okay. What's the numerator become? What's the LCD, first of all? Um, 2 times 2 plus x. Okay. What goes here? Um, what? What fraction is equal to this fraction? That's what you're always trying to determine. What do I have to put here in the numerator so that I have not changed the fraction? Well, wouldn't... Um, about two? two? There you go. Notice the twos cancel and I end up with 1 over 2 plus x. Okay, what goes here? Um, that would be mm, 2 plus x. There you go. Now combine those two. What do we have? Hold, hold on a second. I need to move this that way. So the new numerator, in other words, we now have a denominator for the new numerator, right? Yeah. What's the numerator for the numerator? Um, 2 minus 2 plus x. Which is? Uh, x. No, this minus sign has to be applied to the x also. Negative x. Negative x. Okay, so that's my new numerator. 
I have my old denominator there. Well, now I can cancel stuff. How do I do this division? I, excuse me, I flip the denominator and multiply, right? That's how we do division of fractions. I pretend there's a one under that. I flip it, I multiply, and what am I left with? Um. What? Okay. Negative one. In other words, here's what I'm doing. I've got minus x over two times two plus x. I'm going to flip this and multiply instead of divide. So it becomes that. You with me? Mm -hmm. The x's cancel, and I'm left with minus 1 in the numerator, and in the denominator, 2 times 2 plus x. Now we can take the limit of that. As x goes to 0, what is it? As x goes to 0, it would be negative 1 fourth. That's how you do it. In other words, any time that the first substitution yields 0 over 0, then you need to do some algebraic manipulation of it until it yields something where when we plug in 0, we don't get 0 over 0. In other words, we now get minus 1 over 4. So that's the limit. And that's just one way to solve these difficult limit problems. But, like I said, the only difficult limit problems are the ones that are 0 over 0 or infinity over infinity, like number 6. What is the limit when x goes to infinity in this situation? 2 fifths. All right. You got that. In other words, it's always the coefficient of... The ratio of the coefficients, as long as these powers are the same. If My teacher has a If this was x third, what would the limit be? Um, is it? I know it's either. Which one is x to the third? Let me write it. If I had this, and I wanted to know what the limit was as x goes to infinity, what is it? Is it infinity? No. Which one is blowing up? The bottom? The bottom, the bottom. so it's zero. Bottom, right. In other words, this is going to go to some number over infinity. Well, some number over infinity is zero, no matter what the number is. If the bottom blows up and the top stays constant, it's going to zero. If the top blows up and the bottom stays constant, what is this one going to? Um, infinity. Right. In other words, it's whatever is the greatest power is what rules. Since x cubed, and I don't even care about these numbers. Those aren't even important. The only thing I care about is the highest degree polynomial. If it's in the numerator, the whole thing's going to infinity. If it's in the denominator, the whole thing's going to zero. If they are the same, then the whole thing is going to the ratio of those coefficients. About seven. Seven would be um, one twelve. What's the highest degree in the numerator? Um, the highest degree is the x to the fourth. That's the only thing you care about. You don't care about Unless that x to the third. It says the answer is one twelve. It's not one twelve. The numerator um, blows up, and the denominator does not. The numerator is greater than the denominator. So this goes to infinity. Oh. Are you sure? Because on our answer key it says 112. Positive. 
Okay, so the answer key is wrong? Yes. Okay. In, in other words, the end behavior of any rational function is determined only by the highest degree polynomial. We don't even care about that x to the third. That doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is this x to the fourth. In the denominator, the only thing that matters is the 12x to the third. Well, which goes faster to infinity, x to the fourth or x to the third? Um, x to the fourth. Right. If I had this as the problem, if I had x to the fourth over 12x to the third, simplify that for me. That would be... Um, X over oh, 12. Okay, what happens as X goes to infinity? Um, it goes to, Y goes to infinity? Exactly. In other words, if the, if the numerator rules, it always goes to infinity. If the denominator rules, it goes to zero. And by ruling, I mean which one blows up faster. And it's always the highest power. And when you're talking x going to infinity, then you're talking end behavior. When it says x goes to plus or minus infinity, you're talking the end behavior. And actually, this has two answers. If you're going to plus infinity, then the limit goes to plus infinity. If you're going to negative infinity, the limit goes to negative infinity, just like that does. You go in and tell your teacher that that's a typo. Okay. And he will agree with me. I trust. I assure you. Okay. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. This is a little different. These are a little tougher here. If I do a direct substitution, what do I get? Um. The sine of two, I mean the sine of zero over zero. What's, Which is, I do not know. The sine of zero. I don't know. It's zero. Oh. So you end up with zero over zero. Okay. Now, the one thing that they've taught you about limits is this. The, the sine of x over x as x goes to 0 is equal to what? 0? No, 1. Oh. Even though it's 0 over 0, that's why 0 over 0 is called indeterminate. Because you can't tell if it's 0, some number, or infinity. It could be any of those three. So you have to do more work. Now, they give you this to memorize because it's so vital to so many of these problems that they're giving you. And they can't explain why this is one yet because you're not into calculus. In other words, it's kind of a catch-22. They can't explain why this is one. They have to tell it to you that it's a fact. Uh, but when you get further into calculus, they'll be able to show you why this is 1. But the fact is it's 1, which means the limit of 2x over 2, or the sine of 2x over 2x would also be 1. Okay. Okay. So let's change this problem into making it the limit of the sine of 2x over 2 times 2x. Well, I can turn this problem into the sine of 2x over 2x times 1 over 2. Notice that this is the same as this. Well, what's the limit of the this one here? Uh, one half? No, it's, well, not the left part. 
as I go as x goes to 0 this is the same problem as the sine of x over x it's just Instead of x, it's 2x over 2x. So we know this is always 1. So 1 times 1 half, the limit of that thing would be 1 half. Okay. What is the limit of the sine of 7x over 7x as x goes to 0? 1. Good. That's key understanding. As long as this thing is the same as that thing, then it's going to be 1. Okay, here, let me make it a little harder. What is the sign? Oops. This is the one you usually get on a test. What is that as x goes to 0? Um, five? Yeah, because I can separate it. In other words, I can multiply the top by five and the bottom by five. And now I have five times sine of five x all over five x. We know that is one. So five times one is five. Yep. All right. The cosecant of zero. Well, well, first of all, as x goes to zero, this denominator goes to zero. You see that? Regardless yeah. of what, well, hold on a second. Cosecant x. Cosecant is the reciprocal of what? The cosecant of zero is the reciprocal no. What is of cosecant the function, the reciprocal of? Oh, um... Ah. Sign. Right, sine, which means that the cosecant curve sits on top and bottom of the sine curve. That's what it means, that it's the reciprocal. So if I go to graph the cosecant curve, that's it right there. Right. And wherever it's the, wherever the sine is equal to zero, the cosecant is equal to infinity. In other words, the cosecant curve has vertical asymptotes. You can't take the cosecant of zero. You can't take the cosecant of pi. You can't take the cosecant of two pi. Each of those produce infinity. So, I got a problem here. I got x, which is 0, times the cosecant of 0, which is infinity. Well, when you have 0 times infinity, that's also indeterminate. Um, indeterminance is something you don't generally get until you get into calc BC. But indeterminants are 0 divided by 0, 0 times infinity, or infinity divided by infinity. In other words, we don't know what those are without further investigation. We don't know what that is. We don't know what that is. So whenever you're taking the limit and you end up with something that's 0 times infinity, you got problems you got to do further further work, okay? And we've got 0 times infinity up there also, but plus 1. Well, let's see if we can't simplify this expression. What is this equal to? 1. Separate it into two fractions. Um, the cosecant. No, no. What, I've, what I've written on my page, separated in two uh, fractions. A over C plus B over C. Okay. Now separate what you see on the screen into two fractions. Um, X times the cosecant of X over X times the cosecant of X. 
plus one times the co and plus one over the cosecant of x x times the cosecant of x. Okay, that actually helps a lot. What is this equal to? One. One. Zero? One. One. It's the same thing in the numerator as it is in the denominator. That makes it equal to 1, regardless okay. of what x is going to. I could have x going to 100. I could have x going to minus a half, to 0, to infinity. This is always 1. So I got 1 plus 1 over 0 times infinity. That's not helpful. I still don't know what it is because I don't know what zero times infinity is. That could be anything. Right. So we have to do more work here. Um, let's replace it with its reciprocal. What's the reciprocal you said? Sign Oh, yeah. Okay. Now let's flip the denominator and multiply. So I'm going to multiply both terms in the numerator by sine x over x. You with me? Yeah. What do I get in the first case? Um, you get 1. Plus 9x over x. And we're doing this as x goes to 0. Well, we know about sine x over x. They told us to memorize it. Right. So what's this limit? Um, that limit would be 2. You got it. Okay. Okay, and that's the way you want to do them. In other words, okay. you want to memorize what that limit is as x goes to 0 is always 1. And whenever you get these kind of trig functions, try to turn it into sine. Try to get, okay. try to get sine x over x if you can, because you know what that limit is. And it's the same limit as sine of cx over cx. In other words, that limit is 1 also. As long as this thing is the same as this thing, then that limit is 1. Now, um, I know we're at the end of the session here. Um, you want to you wanna stop? Uh, yeah, I have to go. All right. And do you have a final coming up? Um, in a couple of weeks. Okay. Uh, I got you down for Wednesday at 7. You want me to leave that down there? Um, yeah, for now. All right. All right. Uh, All right. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I'll talk to you next time. All right. Bye-bye.